want. So um, let's talk about what you guys want to talk about. What is going on out there in your lives that you want to dive into this week? Open forum, it's up to you. Otherwise, I will teach you some stuff about building a pipeline. And I was supposed to have a guest uh, presenter today. Uh, my friend, Jeff Talbot, one of my coaches, he's a, a sphere slash um, social media sphere building expert. And he is going to do a session with you guys, just not today, because he's still stuck in quarantine. Um, he's quarantining in New Zealand. So in the meantime, what do you guys have for me? Shoot or pop it in the chat if you don't, if you're too shy to actually say something. So we, got a, we got a new um, objection. OK. What, let's hear it. What's the, uh, the lead or qualified him on the phone says, why should I receive emails from your website? Why would property listing emails be of value to me? Cool. Um, well, I was under the impression, Mr. Buyer, that you were considering purchasing a property. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, awesome. So the best way for me to give you information. But they're also went on to they went on to say that they um, have got, you know, on several websites and they're getting too much email. Cool. So How do we distinguish us from the herd? Totally understand. So which, which websites are your favorite? That's the question. I like so the best, maybe Redfin. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, me too, man. Uh, yeah. I'll be honest. I'll be honest with you, Mark. When I was shopping for a home, I was on, I'm a Redfin guy. It's a dirty little secret, but I'm going to tell you, I'm a Redfin guy myself. You know what my wife likes? My wife likes Zillow and roses. So, mm -hmm. you know, I once met a gentleman. He told me he used Trulia. I couldn't believe he admitted it. That's like admitting you shop at Lowe's. Trulia is designed for women. Um, it's just, it, it, some people have different preferences. Look, I'm not here to judge. Whatever pronoun people want to go by is totally okay with me. So, um, you know, I would just, I wouldn't force it. If he says he doesn't like your, your website or whatever, I would say, look, you know, the standard line, the standard objection handler there is, you know what, here's the deal. There's a lot of bad information out there on Zillow and there's a lot of bad information on Redfin. And the only way I know you're getting the right information is if I'm the one sending it to you. So if you get it from my site, I know you can trust it. If you get it from another site, I'm not really sure. But the bottom line is it doesn't really matter where you get it from. I want you to come back to me with it. So whether you see it on Redfin or Zillow or Trulia or whatever website you want to look at, when you see something that's interesting, I want you to save my phone as Mark, the best realtor on the planet. Just go ahead and save that right in your phone. In fact, I'll send my contact over to you right now. It's actually stored that way. I actually have a friend of mine, a referral partner of mine. Her, her contact says my favorite realtor. And then it has her name. And when she meets people, she shares her contact that way. And when I go to text her, I just type in my favorite realtor because I thought it was funny when she gave it to me that way. And I was like, you know what? You're a genius. And so if you just save your contact info that, like I know a lot of ISAs. If you don't know what an ISA is, an ISA is an inside sales agent. And an inside sales agent is like a cold caller, right? They do a lot of appointment setting and they, they do either outbound or inbound call, you know, it's an appointment setting all day. And um, I knew an ISA named Anna, she's one of the best in the business. And she would actually tell people, hey, go ahead and save my number in your phone as realtor Anna. And then anytime you have a question about anything in real estate ever, I want you to text it to me. Now she was not the real estate agent. She wasn't gonna be the person selling them the home, but it didn't really matter, right? She just needed to prime the communication to say, no matter where you see it, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is, but I will go ahead and bird dog it for you. So send it all to me, I'll do all the work for free, and that's how I'll earn your trust over time. And, and look, you just met me, so why the hell would you want my email? In fact, I don't like my emails, I don't like the emails from Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, Bomb, Bomb, you know, whatever. I don't even like the, the emails from Vegas telling me I have free rooms at the Venetian, right? Like, I don't wanna see any extra emails. So I, you know, you gotta lean into that, right? You gotta, you gotta validate the fact that emails suck. Right? Would we all agree that emails suck? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing mm -hmm. I would do is I would get clarity. So I would say, look, you know, Mark, thanks so much. I really appreciate you being honest with me there and telling me that you hate my emails. And I, I don't blame you at all. I hate emails too. Um, why don't we do this? Let's get super, super, super clear about what you're looking for. So you're looking for a three bedroom, two bath within a five mile radius of the one, two, three main street that you called in on, right? 
And then he'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what else? Oh, we need a little yard for the dog. Okay, what else? This, that, whatever, right? I would get every piece of data that I could get on this person. Then I would set that search up for myself. So it would come through your website or the MLS or wherever you want. And I would have it alert me immediately when those properties came available. I would double check on myself to say, does this match what he told me he wants? And then I would shoot him a personalized text that said, hey, this one just came on the market. And then I would follow that up with a little video saying, hey, Mark, how's it going? I just, I triple checked it. It's got the little yard for, you know, Snippins the dog and, you know, seven other things that you talked about. And it's got the all white kitchen that your wife loves. I really think this is a great one. Why don't you take a look at it? I won't waste your time with any of the bullshit. So that can be a huge like way to add value as well is to have that like concierge style service, right? Cause can anybody just sign up for Zillow? and just get mm -hmm. property alerts? Is that unique? Yeah. Is that, is that mm -hmm. a value proposition these days? Like, no. It's like, oh, click here to see your home value. Like, is that a value proposition these days? No. In 2004, that was a really nifty fucking trick. Today, that's, that's just low hanging fruit. That's just bad bait, right? So if you wanna be really successful, upgrade your offer. If you had something, if you had, if you had the secret list of the off-market properties in the area that he wanted to look, I guarantee fucking to you he'd sign up for your website, right? Happily, he'd already be on there. He'd be so thrilled because that's what they want, right? So the, the problem is your website doesn't give people what they want. It gives people what you want, which is their contact info and their behavioral profile and their shopping habits when they're on your site. Can I follow up on that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So uh, what John's saying is, is absolutely right. And so a good way to uh, to kind of combat that or, or objection handle that is, is agree with them and say, you know what, there is no value in search anymore. You, you're getting that from multiple, uh, multiple sites, multiple areas for, you know, our value is not really in the search anymore, but I guarantee you, uh, Mr. Buyer, that if a home comes up on the market in Irvine, I've seen it. So the value to me is, when you see a property that comes through Zillow that you really like and you shoot it over to me, I've already actually toured that property because part of my day is going out and looking at the new listings. So anything that you see, I've already been inside the property and give you the ins and outs of it that you can't see in the photos that you can't see in the, in the information. Now, of course, that's hyper local 122 brand new listings today, all in, you know, in our MLS, not something you can do, but you could do the 11 listings in Irvine right? Or at least drive by them, give, get some sort of sense of the property. Um, and if that's part of your day, if that's part of what you can provide to uh, those buyers that are coming through your website, there becomes a value proposition to working with you because you're the one that's out, you know, touching and feeling those properties versus just sending an email, right? So you can agree with them and say, you know what, totally, you don't need my emails. There's no value in search with me, but the value lies in me going out and taking a look at these properties for you before I even send them over, you know, before we even set an appointment to go see them because I don't want it to be a waste of your time. And because, you know, I'm going to assume that you've gotten some upfront information from this person as to what they're looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's where like specific niche marketing and, and running a niche business is going to really benefit you. When you only focus in, in one zip code or one location or one tract or you're geo farmer or you, um, or you just specialize in new homes or you're running new, new construction, new home sales ads, whatever you're doing, if you're, if you're narrow, then you can have really deep market knowledge. When you're really wide, like I cover a very wide geography and I always have, and there are benefits to that and there are definite drawbacks. And so, you know, you can do either way but you need to pick a, pick a path, either be cover a wide territory and have a little bit of knowledge about everything and be able to help guide people between different options in that geography or in that market stratification or get really narrow based on a price point, right? I only do 500 to 700 or I only do 300 to 500 or whatever, or a geography and say, I only work within this circle. And when you do that, you're going to get extraordinary depth on the market. So when a lead calls in or when you call a lead to follow up and they say, yeah, I was looking at one, two, three main street over in the new, you know, Balboa coves, you can be like, oh yeah, you know what? That's the plan too. 
It actually, that one, they've already, they're three quarters of the way done with construction. It's going to be ready to go July 15th. I know that it's had a $15,000 lot premium because it's on that nice little pie shaped lot. Like when you have that kind of depth on the fly, when they pick up the phone, now they think they're talking to the sales agent. Now they're talking to an expert. When you pick up the phone and you're like, yeah, whatever. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if we can see it. Let me call the listing agent. Let me see like in this market, there's no value there, right? You're just making your life a thousand times harder. Um, all right, that was a good one. What else do you guys want to chat about? What other questions do you have? Objections you want to overcome? Um, anything from building your business, what books to read, um, best places to go on vacation when things open up, which vaccine I recommend. It's not Johnson and Johnson, FYI. Any uh, any concerns over Related. EXP stock? It's kind of been in a, That's a great consistent question. decline. Yeah, really. Shit, are you a are you a math major, Chris? I thought you were an attorney. Um, no, I, but I I can see the charts doing this every it's day. Amazing, <laughs> you're you're a very observant person. Um, no, so do I? I look at it every hour, John. So do I have concern about EXP stock? Yeah, I have concern about EXP stock. I don't like to see my stock go down. Um, do I have concern about it long term? No, I've never sold a share. I'm still buying. I look at it as if you don't have enough shares in your portfolio to to retire on then you should be happy that it's down because it's an opportunity to pick up more shares. So I'm just using it as a buying opportunity to accumulate more of my fortune. The company got better, not worse in the last two months. So I don't, I don't care that the stock price isn't reflective of that. Uh, it was a little toppy. I considered pulling some off the table at the high. I didn't. The reason I didn't is I didn't really want to play the tax, pay the taxes and I didn't have any better use for the money. So there wasn't really anywhere I wanted to put it or anything I wanted to do with it. So I let it sit there and I'm riding through it. If you look at the chart, if you go back, if you guys want to learn how to chart, I'll share my screen right now. Show you guys how to do this. Um, so if you look at this stock chart, you can see the six months. So see these levels. So see it had run up all the way to 80 and it technically really hit 90. And what this is, this, this right here is called the double peak. And so this is an indicator that the stock is very likely not going to stay at these levels. So this is actually in retrospect this is a bad sign. Um, and, and we knew, right? Like, look at this. I mean, that, that is not, these tops are not sustainable, right? So what you do when you look at this is you say, where's the support? And right now we know the support is here at 60 and these are not adjusted for the split. So we see this really, these two levels as being pretty strong, right? Right here, we see 40 bucks and then down here, down to $30. So I think if you look at this, this $29 limit and this here, I don't see it going below that $30 mark. And it's probably gonna trend back up towards these levels, these 50, right? These levels right here. So I think we're just looking to bounce. If it if it holds 37 or 39, like this level right here, great. I'm not but sure we're looking at what you're talking about. What was that? I'm not sure we're looking at what you're talking about. Are you guys not on my screen? We see your screen, but it's a, a messy middle mastermind roster. No, you're on the wrong one. On yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> can you explain one more time? Yeah, I'll John. Show you again. Sorry, it did the screen share. It shared the screen, but it did the wrong one. There, how's that? Okay, yeah. That makes more sense? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so here are the two tops where it peaked out right before the stock split. As soon as the stock split, it peaked and then it started this downtrend that he's talking about. So if I go on a one month chart, it's really clear to see that downtrend, right? And what this actually makes is this makes a little triangle. So if you start here, and you go straight across this line at the bottom, it ends up almost exactly where we are right now, right? We're at 30, this was at 39.85, we're at 37.32. And what I was saying about support is these levels here. So this 30 and this 29, these seem to be the, the real bottom. And so if it's gonna break through this trend line and hit a bottom, it's gonna get down to 30. My hope is that it bounces off of this line here at 39, and reverses this current trend. And so if it can bounce, hopefully off of these levels here, and my guess is it's because there's options expiring on the 16th, 
And so once these options expire on the 16th, I'm hoping we start a new trend going back towards this sort of $55, $60 range. And I think the 55, 60, maybe 65, that's all sort of in a stable, you know, that represents a pre-split level of $120, $100 to $120. And I, I think that's a fair range. I think anything above that is a little overinflated for sure. Sorry, and that probably made a lot more sense when I was on the right screen share. Uh, probably didn't make much sense before that. Um, all right. So based on a real estate, the business are good right now. Why the EXP stock is down? Oh, so why is the stock down? Good question. So um, inflation. So everybody's very concerned that we will see too much inflation. Um, that is that's just a negative general market trend um, that, that is scaring some of the, the market. Number two is interest rates going up. Can you mute yourself really quick? Sorry. I'll mute you. There we go. Um, anyway, um, so number two is in, uh, so number one is inflation. Number two is interest rates. So if interest rates go up, people will be priced out of buying a home, and they're not going to be able to buy as many homes, and that could signal something negative for the market in general. But the biggest reason is that everybody has taken that money from the tech sector, where you had these very high price to earnings ratios, and they've gone towards more value stocks. They've rotated to more of the reopening trade. So EXP got lumped into the market sector of a stay at home stock. So if people are not allowed to go to work, then they're more likely to join EXP. As a result, the stock got a lot of boost like Zoom, uh, Peloton, a lot of those names were all similar chart patterns. And when that money got pulled, those were very toppy. They had, you know, 200 PE ratio, you know, cra crazy numbers, right? Not fundamental trading. And so when that happened, the, the smart money took all their money and they went and put it in things like um, like energy, right? That's a big sector that's that's benefited in the last three months. So those are- those Thank are you, John. Those are sector rotational trades, which will come back around, yeah. right? The two strongest yeah. quarters in real estate are the spring and the summer. And so once we start to see those dollars and those metrics come in, that should help give some catalyst to give the stock a boost. I am not, a financial analyst, I am not giving you stock advice. I am just giving you my opinion for fun about a stock that I follow very closely. Um, no, awesome, John. It's, I really appreciate it, honestly. Thank you. Absolutely. So this is not considered in, inside the trading. Insider trading is when a- um, I, I know, I'm kidding. When, a, when an insider sells, but- no, I mean, there's, I'm not, I don't know. I have no knowledge about the company that nobody, that isn't public. I'm not disclosing anything as a secret. I'm just saying like, I think that this is what's gonna happen. And I know we're adding 4,000 agents a month and that's the only metric that I think really matters, so. Next question. Yeah, I, I had a question about um, expired listings. Sure. Uh, it's a sector that I'm trying to target. I was listening to a podcast. This guy said he was having success on it. I was just wondering what strategies I should implement, what even how to start. I mean, I know there's like calling. You can do like phone lists on Red X and things like that. Um, or like I was thinking just mailing them a letter. Um, like what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, my first question is, do you prefer to fight with a sword, an ax, or a battle hammer? Uh, what am I fighting? You're fighting the other real estate agents. I so, guess the last one. All right, perfect, battle hammer it is, I love it. Um, no, I, I start with that as a joke, as, as an honest joke, because that is, you're, <laughs> you're, you're talking about getting into the arena, right? You're talking about becoming a gladiator. And I am a big advocate for gladiators. I love, I love the idea of the movie 300. And I love the idea of David and Goliath. And um, that's what you're kind of talking about. So it's a way that you're going to learn a yeah. lot. It's a way you're going to get a lot of experience. It's a way that through your just sheer tenacity, you might start to get some results. You're also in one of the most competitive places in the market. You're also in one of the most limited places in the market because there aren't really any expireds right now. So yeah. if the property didn't sell, what is it? Right? Why is it expired? Well, it's probably expired because the seller's unrealistic or it was overpriced or 
all of the above or whatever, right? It, it smelled like cat pee or somebody died in it or who knows, right? So something really bad probably happened. So you're already going into a shitty situation and then you're competing with like 20 or 30 other people by 7.30 a.m. in the morning if you're calling. And if yeah. you don't call the first day by 7.30 a.m., you probably shouldn't call at all. And then once you do call or don't call, you may or may not set an appointment. You might want to call back two or three days later when they've had a chance to calm down. Because if you catch them at 8.30 on the first morning, they're going to be like, you're my 57th call, fuck off. And they're going to hang up on you. And that's not me being colorful. That's me being like 100% realistic. That is exactly sure. what's going to happen. And yeah. so, you know, you call later, or like you said, you're smart. You're like, maybe I'll send them a letter. Maybe I'm, well, what's that letter going to say, right? And how many people are sending it? And what's your budget? How many of these are you going to send them out to? See, mm -hmm. what I might do if I was going to go after expireds is I might go after old expireds. People that expired a year ago or expired two years ago that didn't get their price because chances are they can get their price today. And whatever happened back then, they've probably cooled off from and they probably realized now they're probably still unrealistic today, right? If they wanted 900,000 two years ago, they probably want 2 million today, right? Something insane. But if you can catch them in something semi-realistic and talk them to a number and get back to motivation, right? What you have to do with expireds is you always have to come back to their motivation because they're okay. pissed off because somebody disappointed them. They had a plan. They had an idea. They had a goal. Somebody told them they could make it happen and then fell short. And so until you can, you can get on their level and get really pissed off with them and be like, yeah, that's bullshit, man. I can't believe that guy fucked you over. Like da, 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 da. And then, and then once you mirror them, you can move them. Right. Um, yeah. Mark, you got anything you want to throw in on expireds? Yeah, lots. Um, the one thing that just about no agent does because they'd rather hit the phones and hit well, there's only two today, so you're not going to really <laughs> call them very many. But generally, uh, what most agents don't do is go directly to the door. And you can go there and get have actually a really good conversation with somebody who maybe is sick of the phone ringing, and yet you're just there with your likable, presentable kind of uh, attitude to say, hey, I'm just here to help right? My, my favorite question to ask any expired listing when I'm calling or knocking on their door is, I noticed your home came off the market. Just curious what your plan is for the property. Open-ended question, let them talk, right? If it, and they're going to give you all kinds of reasons, right? Whether it's, I was getting transferred from my job and I lost my job, or uh, I, I'm not getting the, the, the job transfer anymore, or um, I think the, the market's too hot. I don't want to, you know, whatever. Like you're going to get, you're going to run the gamut of what uh, they're going to say. And then of course, the ultimate goal is to get an appointment with them. But there's conversation that needs to go on. And of course we can do some more role play practice on, on this type of stuff, which, you know, we still need to do. I want to do a, a, a daily role play call that you guys can all jump in on, uh, but you can, we can practice these scripts, but, um, but yes, uh, you should go after expireds, but today's day and age for sale are more for sale by owners, right? So hot sellers market, you're going to see more for sale by owners. You can go after them and, and, you know, there's different ways to approach that with uh, what are you doing to get your property sold? Uh, your property's still on the market after two weeks. Most properties are selling within four days. So can I show you how, you know, we can get your home actually sold for you and you have to go back to the motivation that John was talking about, find the reason why they're actually selling and then tap into that motivation to get that, uh, that seller off the fence and potentially working with you. Um, but that's, that's a better lead source today than an expired is unless you're doing the old expireds from like a year ago, two years ago. Um, and you know, the, 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 the script with that is, um, I noticed you tried to, you were, you were selling your home last year for some reason it didn't work out. What's your plan for the property now? Right. Just ask that same question. Don't mess it yeah. up. Don't, don't mix it up because the more you try to remember uh, whatever, I always like to keep my scripts very simple and, and very common. So I remember them all the time. So my, I always have those same questions built into maybe a different approach, but it's still that same question that I'm, I'm posing to them as to what is your plan for the property and let them talk. Yeah. What, you know, what's your plan for the property and let them talk is an amazing script. You know, people always ask, they're like, what's the, what do I call when I like call my sphere? And right? when I call my sphere of influence, what do I say? Hey, what's up? 
right? Like just calling them and, and starting a conversation sometimes is all you need to do. If you just learn to listen and you learn to get people talking, um, people just want to talk. People just want to be heard. If you could be known as like the world's greatest listener, I think that would go a long way for everybody's sales career. Um, it's just, that's been a goal of mine for, I don't know, 10 years now. And I feel like I'll never get there because I'm always just trying to become a better listener and a better listener and a better listener. Um, yeah, Mark, you want There's to something on that. Yeah, I mean, just to keep, just, I mean, this is kind of old adages, but I mean, if, if you guys are new to, to lead generation, this might be new to you. A, a good framework for having a conversation with sphere of influence, past clients, that kind of thing is an acronym called FORD, F-O-R-D. It's basically called the FORD method. And that's, it stands for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams, which is a little woo-woo. And I kind of, you can leave that one out, but at the same time, it gives you the framework. So perfect example, Facebook is your friend and you're talking about the people that you know, right? So I'll give you an example. Today's my anniversary, right? If someone called me to wish me a ha happy anniversary versus just posting on my Facebook happy anniversary under the photo that I posted or liking my photo, there's a deeper connection there. So little Jimmy just hit their first home run this past weekend and mommy posts about it. The best thing for you to do is pick up the phone and say, Hey, I noticed Jimmy hit his first home run this weekend. That's awesome. How, I bet you that was, uh, you know, fun to celebrate with the family. And all of a sudden you just opened up a conversation to have with somebody that you know. And then if they're a good conversationalist, do, they'll do the same thing. How's everything with your family? Uh, great. And then how's, how are things at work that we're getting into the, O, oh, the occupation, if they are a good conversational to ask, ask the same thing. So what's going on with work with you? Well, I'm super excited. Cause I, you know, I wanted to share this with you. I'm glad we, we connected is that I just got into the real estate business. The market's crazy right now. Uh, have you, have you had any thoughts of, uh, jumping into the market in, in either an investor capacity or, or selling your home. You can go direct and start asking those questions or just share with people that you got into real estate and you're excited about it and let the conversation kind of evolve from there. But then recreations, obviously, Hey, summer's coming up. What are you guys doing for vacation? Is COVID still kind of keeping you guys down or are you going on a road trip somewhere? It's just conversation, right? So that's the best way to reach out to your sphere, past clients, just, just or even just your acquaintances that you know. Help, helpful, Patrick? Yeah, thank you. I think for me, it was just even just getting information on what other agents are doing to approach it. Because as of right now, the only thing I've got is just like researching articles. So the best I feel like thing, I, the best yeah, thing I ever it. heard was some people that put like a little disc together or something or a website and they mailed it. And when you logged in, it gave you a walkthrough, a video walkthrough on the computer of your listing. It pulled up the listing. It showed you the pictures it showed you and it showed you everything that they thought was wrong with it and all the things that they would do to fix it in like a one minute version, like a, Hey, this, this, we noticed this, this was wrong. Like basically pick it apart. But then as soon as it was done, it was gone. And the only way you could get the information a second time is if you reached out and said, Hey, I want to talk to you. And so, so they gave this to the like potential seller, the seller. Yeah. The person who was okay. trying to sell. So the expired would get a, a thing and it would say, Hey, to see the five biggest mistakes your prior agent made, click on this link. And then they would go to the web, the URL, right. Which was probably their home address already or whatever, you know, mistakes in one, two, three main street.com. If you want to get cute with it. Right. Like we're talking like, this is chess, not checkers. And, um, and then when they clicked in, they would watch a quick video that would show, but then the video was only played one time and it, okay. you know, it self-destructed. And that really got some people's attention and definitely got a lot of phone calls, especially at the higher price point. Because a lot of the properties that expire in our market are higher price point properties. Lower price point properties almost always sell. If you find a $700,000 house that didn't sell in Orange County, you got a problem. Yeah. Okay. And you would get this information, like, as far as what they did wrong off like MLS or you'd have whatever. to look it up. Right. Yeah. You'd have yeah. to look and say, Oh, you know, they started way too high. They, they, 
brought the price down. They didn't bring in enough. They have the square footage wrong. They didn't put in the lot size. They didn't fill out the local school information. There's 14 typos in the copy. They wrote the thing in all caps because they're from the eighties, like whatever. Right. And you just, you break it down and you know, your pictures suck. Like I personally, am, I believe that it is bullshit that we can't call out the agent when they listen to us and do a bad job. I think that we should be able to call their clients and say, you're, you hired a bozo. He's got one picture of the front of the house. It's all grainy. He drove it. He, he drove by and didn't even slow down to take the picture. Um, we're not allowed to do that. Right. That's an ethics violation. I think that's bullshit because the consumer is ultimately the person that we all need to be concerned about protecting. And so when you can trash the other agent is once it expires. So, you know, not that you should go around trashing other agents, but let's be real. Like, if they didn't put the photos in, if they made all these mistakes, like that's probably why the house didn't sell, especially in a market like this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the input. But long story short, Mark, Mark's right. For sale by owners are much more plentiful today than expired. So if I were going to do expireds, it'd go old expireds. If I were going to do something for now business, it would be for sale by owners. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Okay. Do you guys want to learn how to build a pipeline from scratch really fast? So you guys can all generate some business. I'll give you the best way to do that. Yeah. So, okay. all right. So let's, we could do it two ways. So one, we can do it where I, uh, I start from scratch. I just got into real estate, but I've lived somewhere my entire life, which is the way we would prefer to do it where we already have kind of a head start, or we can do it. I have to start from scratch. I just was dropped into an unknown, unknown location. I know no one, I know nothing, and I, I have no friends and I need to start from scratch, right? How would you build a pipeline? Oh, scratch. You guys wanna go the hard yeah, one? Yeah, one. Yeah, let's go with the really hard one. Yeah, fuck the spare <laughs> Um Okay, cool. So we'll just get right to it. So I'm dropped into, I relocate to Cleveland, Ohio, right? and I need to build a real estate business from scratch. Mark, I'm gonna get your input on this too as we go along if I run out of ideas. So um, I show up in Cleveland today. I, first thing I do is I get my real estate license. I get a bunch of business cards, like you know, 500 business cards because I'm gonna need them as I go, whatever. And I'm gonna set out to figure this out. I'm gonna sign up for the MLS. I'm gonna get all the property alerts and I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna start studying the market every day. So the first day I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna realize that I don't have any appointments and I don't have any database and I don't have anything else to do. The only job, I have one job at this point. I actually two, I'll go with two jobs. I have two jobs. What are my two jobs on day one in Cleveland? What was that? Sorry. What was that? Sorry. Okay, anyone? Okay. Two jobs, day one in Cleveland, what are they? I think maybe um, you can ask your friends who, you know, live in friends. Cleveland. Yeah. Oh, I could. You're right. So I have two jobs. Number one, I need to meet people in Cleveland. Number yeah. two, I need to start learning about the Cleveland housing market. Wouldn't it be mm -hmm. cool if I could do both of those things at the same time? Right? Yeah. So I'm going to pull up the MLS. I know no one in Cleveland. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get up early. I'm going to pull up the MLS and I'm going to look for all the new listings that day. I'm gonna look for all the expired listings. I'm gonna look for everything that's hot that I need to know about the market. And I'm gonna print out that information so I have it with me, right? Then I'm gonna leave my house early, super early. I'm gonna to go to the busiest gym in town. I'm gonna to work out for an hour with a t-shirt on that says, I sell houses, talk to me about real estate, something funny about real estate. I'm gonna have a swag. My partner has, a, has one that says, the only thing hotter than the housing market is this ass. And she wears it to work out, I swear to God. So you pick your comfort level, but I would wear a billboard about what I do when I went to the gym. And I would make it a point to talk to the guy at the front desk who checks people in. I'd get to know the manager. I would bring you know, bagels, donuts, protein shakes, whatever the hell you bring to a gym early in the morning to schmooze those people up. I go to the same gym every day. I'd go at the same time and I'd start to meet people that way. As Soon as I was done with the gym, I would go to the busiest breakfast place in town. I would schmooze the hostess, the manager, the owner. I'd ask him if we could film a, a, a video. I would film a video of the gym. I'd interview the GM. I would go deep on it. Even if nobody ever watches it, I would get to know these people. I would create the most 
awesome promotional pieces for these kind of anchor businesses that are going to be a part of my life. So then I go to the really busy breakfast place. The goal is that it's so busy, there's a line, right? So I have to wait. While I'm waiting, I'm going to chat up every single person that's there. I'm going to start getting their contact information. And I'm going to ask them if they know anybody who's a buyer. Everyone I talk to all day, I'm going to ask them who they know is a buyer for my favorite property that came on the market that day. Hey, I just saw this one come out this morning. The best property in Cleveland. I'm looking for a buyer for it. Who do you know? If I find another hot deal like this, do you want to know about it? Great. What's your phone number? Blah, 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 right? Go on and on and on. Add value. Have your information. Attack that, right? As soon as I'm done at breakfast, I'm going to go out to the 10 listings that were listed today in Cleveland in my territory that I want to work because I'm going to go narrow. And I'm going to door knock 20 properties on each side of every single one of those new listings. And I'm going to say, hey, just I'm from eXp Realty. Just want to let you know your neighbor just listed their house for 750. Who do you know who wants to move into the neighborhood? I'm like, neighbor just listed for 750. Yeah, 750. It's beautiful. Look, here's the pictures. I'd hold up the sign right there. Here's the pictures. Wow, that's amazing. Do you have any other listing? We haven't met before. What's your name? Yeah, my name's John. I'm a local real estate professional. Um, have you thought, you know, I'm looking for a buyer for this house. If you don't know anybody, no problem. But if they don't love that house, would you consider selling your house for around 750? You think I could get 750 for it? Yeah, I do. I think we, we might be able to do it. Would you at least let me show it? Yeah, I'd let you show it. Absolutely. You bring me a buyer for 750, house is yours. You can have the keys tomorrow. Okay, great. So now I'm going to go 20 doors on either side of 10 houses, right? Who's good at math? <sighs> How many houses is that? 20 times 10. It's not that hard. 400. <laughs> no, 20 times 10, 200. 200. 200 doors. I'm going to do 200 doors. How long is it going to take me to do 200 doors? Like two hours. That's like four time. hours. How because many people not, open the door? Well, they're not. Well, hold on. I still got to knock on. I still got to knock on two hundred. So I've got. It would take me about four hours because if they were two hundred doors in the same neighborhood, I could do them in about two hours. But because there are two hundred doors around ten new listings, I have to get in the car and drive to each location. And so when you factor in the drive time, it's going to take you about twice as long. So now I'm going to have spent an hour at the gym, an hour at breakfast, four hours prospecting. Where do you think I'm going after that? to the gym again good good idea i might personally me i'm going to the dog park okay i'm gonna go to the dog park and i'm gonna meet every single person i can meet at the dog park then i'm going somewhere for dinner i'm gonna sit at the bar i'm gonna meet strangers at the bar when i go for dinner i'm gonna interact and by the time i'm done i'm gonna have had at least minimum 50 real estate conversations i knocked on 200 doors 10 percent of those doors open that's 20 contacts right there. I talked to 10 people at the gym. I talked to 10 people at breakfast and I talked to another 10 people at dinner. That's 50. I'm going to do that five days a week for two straight months. How many people will I have met? A lot. 250 a week. 250 people a week right. times two months. Eight weeks. 2,000. 2,000. That's 2,000 contacts in two months, working eight hours a day on nothing but building a pipeline and a database. I promise you, if you do that plan, you will make way more money than you ever thought you could make. Now you have to be good and every day you're going to get better. And then what I would do is as you start to get appointments, I would scale it back. So I would never stop doing any of that. I would just shorten the time it takes me to do all of it. So eventually, instead of going to 10 new listings, I'd go to five. And eventually when I got really busy, I'd go to two. But I would still go to two and I would still knock 40 and I would still talk to five and I would still go to breakfast and I would still go to the gym and I would still do all those things to continue to build in new people. And then what happens is you, you collect 2000 people and you follow up with them systematically every month. So now every month I have to call, the first month I only have to call 50 or the first week, I only have to call 50. The second week I have to call hundred, right? The third week I have to call about a hundred. And then at the end of the month, right, we're going to end up with like, right. By the end of the month, we have a thousand people. And so on month two, I have to call all thousand people that I met or reach out to them some systematic way. And on top of that, I have to start adding in the new people. So every day in this challenge, 
becomes harder and harder and harder. And every day you go forward, you have to drop some of your basic activities that you started with on day one because you start to run out of time as you get more appointments. But that's okay because the entire goal is to set appointments. And then all you do is you create a pipeline report and anytime you meet with somebody, you rank it on a scale of one to 10. Six or below means it did not go well. Seven means we had a good appointment. I came over, I looked at their house. They said, maybe they'll sell in a year. So we had a good appointment. I don't know when they're going to sell. They might buy in a year. They don't know when they're going to buy. There's no urgency. An eight is somebody who's going to sell or buy in three months. A nine is somebody who's going to buy or sell in two months. And a 10 is somebody who's going to buy or sell this month. You grade every single person. And then every single week you go through your pipeline. So if I just talked to Tony last week, and I know he's probably not going to sell for a year, he probably doesn't need to hear from me this week. He probably needs to hear from me in three weeks. If I haven't talked to Melissa in three weeks, and I know she wants to buy in two months, well, then I better get her on the phone because if she's going to buy in two months, then we got to start shopping today. And so every week I do, we call it dispositioning. You disposition your pipeline and you create a next touch date for every single lead you have. And every one of those 2000 people out of 2000, you end up with like 200 leads. And out of those 200 leads, you end up with like 75 appointments. And out of those 75 appointments, you end up with like 50 pieces of business. And out of those 50 pieces of business, 40 deals close. Does that track for you guys? Questions? The only things I had to pay for were my gym membership, my breakfast, my dinner, which I had to eat anyway, MLS access, which I need to be a realtor, gas in my car to drive to the different listings, that starter pack of 500 business cards, which I didn't, by the way, I only got 500 because I'm not giving them to everybody. I'm, I'm actually getting people's contact information as I meet them because I don't want to give them my card. I didn't say go give your card to 2000 people. I said, meet 2000 people and get their contact info. Hey, what's the best number to reach you at? If I find another one of these amazing deals in Cleveland, I have the best property listed today in Cleveland, the hottest one in the whole market, who wants it, right? You start to be proactive. Um, and when you go and circle knock, if you go today, Mark, how many listings in Irvine today? Uh, 11. 11 listings. If you go to any one of those 11 listings now at 3.45 PM on the West Coast, and you knock on 10 neighbors on either side of that door, I guarantee you not a single real estate agent has come by today. The guy who took the listing did not knock on their door and tell them that he took the listing down the street. Promise you. Totally true. So because he's a spoiled prick. Let me, uh, let me back up a lot of that John said. So John knows this. So you, so you all know that I'm not making this up. John knows this about me. I left Orange County and moved to San Francisco because John took over my website when I left to go to San Francisco. Uh, and I did, ex I had to do exactly what John is talking about. I didn't have any contacts. I had to start from square one. The only thing I had was the experience that I brought with me from working here in Orange County. So um, I did several things that John talks about. Um, one of the, so I got connected with, I, you know, I joined a brokerage like anybody else does, right? I joined a brokerage that was one of those like, like boutique very progressive uh, in San Francisco area that's, you know, it's very techy up there. So they were very tech centered and that was kind of their clientele. And so what I did is uh, I did what John's talking about, but only with our company listings, right? So I would go out whenever there was a new company listing I would go out and door knock around that listing as if I was representing the listing, not saying that I was representing the listing, just basically saying, if you, you may have noticed that we listed the property down the street. And when I just say we, I just mean our brokerage. I don't mean me. I don't I, It's not my name on the sign, but my brokerage is on the sign. It's the same brokerage that's on my business card. Right? So that was the conversation. It was an easy way to start uh, building some sort of, uh, clientele out of it. The dog park, I definitely did. And every time I went to the dog park, I made sure I had a company logo on my shirt. So it said, you know, something real estate, right? It was, it was uh, climb real estate at the time. Um, 
Another thing I did, so here in Orange County, I was a member of something called the Center Club. It's basically at uh, Seegerstrom Center. It's a, it's a private business and social club. Well, there's an equivalent club in San Francisco. And so I basically joined that so that I could do the same thing and network and, and have business conversations with people who are there to do business and have business conversations, not just some, you know, not, you know, uh, I don't know, not the, not the, I don't know, pick a restaurant across the street. I don't remember. Yeah. What we're you know, um, daily, daily growth kills it, but yeah, I get your point. Right? Yeah, get, it right. is good to be so, in like a social club. You can do uh, meetup groups. You can, yeah. you know, they do breakfast meetings. There's a lot of places you can go eat and network, but yeah. you get the idea. Right. And so I, I want to basically back up the fact that John's saying all this, that actually turns into business for you because uh, if you're starting from scratch and you have no context to go out and generate those contacts, it's not as hard as you expect it to be. Um, basically thinking that you know nobody or that you're so new that everybody's going to know that. They're only, they're only going to know if that you're new if you tell them. I actually have a member of my team that I try to, I try to beat into her head not to keep telling people that you're brand new because then they're going to second guess whether they should work with you, right? Um, so you, you want to just have that air about you that you know what you're talking about and just have that conversation in your head as what you're looking to accomplish that day. What is your outcome, right? So if you're just door knocking around a listing, what's your outcome? Are you looking for an appointment with a new seller? Great. Are you like what John said, are you looking for a buyer for that listing? That's your outcome. That's what you're trying to go. You're trying to accomplish. So you just have that conversation in your head, right? So uh, everything he's talking about is absolutely true. Um, and you, you could do this tomorrow. You literally could do it tomorrow. And what he said about just go find a new listing. Here's what I've done as I've started leveraging the buyers that I have, right? So if you have a buyer lead come through your website, like Mark, uh, find out what he's looking for in what particular neighborhood. And there's generally probably one or zero listings in that neighborhood. So you can just start calling around or knocking around that neighborhood and saying, I have a buyer. I have a buyer. Are you looking to sell? I have a buyer. Just leverage the buyer. It's the easier opening to that conversation so that you're not presenting yourself as I'm here to try and get your listing. You're there just trying to help your buyer solve their problem of finding a property to buy. Don't say you have a buyer. Don't say you have a buyer if you don't. Right. Only say you have a buyer if you really do. Um, it doesn't really matter if you have a buyer or you just go in and say your neighbor just listed. And it doesn't matter if it's your brokerage or not, as you just say, your neighbor just listed, they'll be shocked. They won't even know their neighbor just listed. So if you catch them on day one, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. 950. That's a lot of money. God. And everybody loves to talk about how much money and equity they have in their house. So it's, it's a good lead in. And then it's like, Hey, would you look at an offer? If the buyer that looks, I'm going to, I'm going to work all day finding a buyer for that house, but there's a good chance they don't like it. If they don't like it, can I show them yours? And then from there, you can say, and they say no, right? Because here's what we're doing. We're saying, do you, do you want to buy it? No. Do you know anybody who wants to buy it? No. Do you want to sell? No. If you did sell, where would you go? That's the magic question at the end because there's always an answer there. If you did sell, where would you go? We'd go to Florida. Great. What's in Florida? My grandkids. Awesome. How much more of their life would you like to miss? What? Oh, I mean, how soon would you like to get to Florida? Right? And when you're good, you can use humor and you can let it, you can, you can layer it in, right? People will laugh. People will, if you're good at it, you can play with that. If you're not good at it, then you just stick, stick to the simple script. When would you like to be in Florida? Well, we're not going to move there until I retire next year. Great. Now, what did I find out? I have a seller for next year. I know who it is. I know where they live. I know what, what their timeline is. I know where they're going. By the way, where are you going in Florida? I know EXP is in Florida. We've got a ton of great agents there. Are you going to you know, Key West or Miami or Orlando? I've got agent friends in all those locations. I'd love to set you up with somebody so you could start learning the market there now, right? Do you think anyone who's talked to them has offered to introduce them to someone in Florida? Probably not. Do we have agents everywhere? Absolutely. So what I would say is try and capture that referral as, as a value add. And then the last thing is 
you know, there's all these new listings and you don't, you're door knocking when door knocking opens back up here shortly. And then you see a listing and you can't go knock on the door, except you can go knock on the door because you can ask them where they're moving because there is a ridiculous frequency, especially when you work for a boutique brokerage or a local brokerage of people who list houses and they don't service the buy side because they're moving out of the area. Oh, I'm moving to Arizona. My agent said he can't help me. Well, you know how much a referral is on a, on a new $750,000 house in Arizona? It's like six grand, seven grand. Like you want that money, right? So there's nothing that says you can't go talk to a seller that's listed with somebody else and ask them where they're moving to. They, they may be moving down the street and they may already hate their agent and have decided that they want to interview somebody else for the job to buy the house. Like, you know, you, you may piss somebody off if you don't do that delicately, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with you going after the buy side of those transactions. And those people have already raised their hand and said, we're moving, you know, because they listen to the house for sale. Okay. I think that's it. What'd you guys learn today? Give me a couple of ahas. I had a quick question as far as you said, getting to know local market information. I've been told to just read like the local paper. I mean, what other things would you look at? Reports on housing.com. Don't read the paper. Okay. Got it. Yeah, and another resource I like, it's free for us through CRMLS. So just log in, go to your home screen. It's um, OC fast stats right? Pull up any stat on any, so you can actually print those out and use those as uh, leave behinds or door knocking type of thing, or just study it. And you can see the year, year over year trend, utilize that in the conversations that you're having. You look smarter. You look like, you know what you're talking about. You got your finger on the pulse of the market. You can start to develop what you feel the trend would be. Um, those are, that's a really good, easy source to utilize. You said fast stats? Yeah, it's called OC Fast Stats. Okay. Through CRMLS. And John, it was what? Reports on housing.com? Not for your market. Huh? It's not for your market. Ah, damn it. Sorry, man. You OC jerks. Um, all right, what'd you guys learn today? I failed you. Was that bad? I learned that your resources only work in Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> You're so full of shit. <laughs> well, there, there was one that may work in. Where are you? Boston, oh, Massachusetts. Oh yeah, never mind. Forget. A lie. <laughs> he, he's not. He doesn't. He doesn't live in the city. That's a lie. Okay. I'm like I'm only a ten minute drive from the city. I was, that was a guess. I was right. <laughs> Boston. Anyway, another, another I'm one. In like, I'm, li I'm in somebody like the give fifth. Me, somebody I'm in like the fifth, call. the biggest city in Massachusetts. So. I don't care. Yeah. Paula, what'd you learn today? You won't let me down. I know I won't because last week you called me out on dropping off stuff right at the door. Fuck yeah, so, I did. Yeah, well, I'm back with my market update and I'm door knocking. So we're we're uh, blocking out two hours today and we're freaking door knocking. So good job. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Um, I think I learned just about how to build your pipeline when you're brand new, especially if you don't know the area, you don't know anyone. The most effective way will be face-to-face -face interaction because that way you can expand the conversation more and then the conversation will flow more naturally instead of spamming people with email because then you have to compete with Zillow or Redfin and a lot of times people would prefer more established companies like Zillow when it comes to emails. So I'd say that face-to-face um, -face, um, conversation is the best. Well, and um, in a normal world, what you would do is you would supplement the five days a week I gave you with open mm -hmm. houses on Saturday and Sunday. But we mm -hmm. don't live in a, in a normal world and there are no open houses. And even if there were, you couldn't get any because there's no good things and all this other shit. So like in a perfect world, you'd do my schedule Monday through Friday. And then you would do Saturday, Sunday open houses and you would work more or less seven days a week for the first six months. And then you would take one day off a week for the next six months. And then you would take two days off a week in your second year and moving forward. But it wouldn't be two weekend days. It would be one weekend day and one weekday day. And then eventually you'd work to a point where you could take both weekends and then you would add a third day off 
and then you'd only work Monday through Thursday in a perfect world, but you gotta work your way up to that. Um, so I have a question about door knocking. Since now we can now host open house, shall we do door knocking on the weekends better because maybe more people will be at home or? No, it doesn't matter. Cause when you're home on the weekends, you don't just sit around, you get, you get up and you do stuff and you go to church and you go to baseball games and all that stuff. Um, the math is about 10% of the doors open. And it doesn't really matter when you knock, morning, noon, night. It's usually old people who wanna talk that are lonely and, <laughs> and they're almost always nice to you. Well, and at the same time, think about all the people now that are working from home based on what we just went through. That's one thing. The other thing is if you can find that nosy neighbor, the one that, that, that has all the gossip in the neighborhood, first of all, you'll be there for a little bit. They're, they like to talk. Second, you're gonna get a ton of information. And they are the they just be their best friend because they will love you and refer you because they just like to talk to people. And if you're likable and talk to you know, they will just love it. So you do enough of it, you'll find them. There are the needle in the haystack. There's one in every neighborhood though. I agree. And you keep working until you find them. And then when you find them, you just go back to them first. That's right. Hey Gladys. <laughs> Gladys, hey, what's up? It's Friday. How's it going? What's new for me this week? I gotta hear the scoop. What's the juice? <laughs> and then, you know, and then she fills you in on all the bullshit. And then, um, and then you go over to, you know, the four people she told you to, she's like, don't say it came from me, but Tim and Nancy, they're getting a divorce. Right. Or like, you know, all the shit. So-and-so yeah. -so. I saw moving boxes over there. Like literally they know, they, they know. <laughs> all right. Anything else guys? Any other ahas? Is good. Did you get something out of this today? Was this good? Happy? Mm -hmm. So let's do this next week. I'll be here instead of John. How about that? Okay. I'm giving Mark the login. Mark will be here uh, next week. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Have a good one. I'll see you later. Bye guys. Hey John, you're awesome, man. You taught us a lot today. Thanks. Thank you. See ya.